so Dune, 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 Dune. So people have been asking me that, spoiler review, spoiler review, spoiler review, but I wanted some time to pass before I really go back in and give you this whole um, deep-seated spoiler review of Dune, you know? Um, so look, first thing to say is this is that I read this book about maybe six or seven years ago because my friend recommended it to me and my friend said, no, you can really like this book because I'm, in, I'm into sci-fi and fantasy. So my friend recommended me the book. So I read it about seven years ago before even those thoughts about this Denis Villeneuve thing being made. After I read the book, I was like, okay, there's some detailed stuff. It goes really into high sci-fi stuff. But when I finished the book, I was like, man, this is an amazing character act. This is an amazing journey. The journey of Paul Atreides from where he starts and where he ends. This is an amazing journey and, ama and an amazing um, story. Specifically of Paul. Again, of where he begins, who he is when he begins. The stuff that he goes through, the events that shape, that shape him and then where he now ends. It's like, wow, look at where he started, look at where he ended. So that's what, what's, what struck me. This is an amazing journey. So... A very distinct difference between the film and the book is this. The book is cut into three chapters. So Frank Herbert has very carefully put the book in three chapters because he feels like these are three important milestones in the story and milestones in Paul's life, shaping who he is. Um, so it can definitely pretty much be a trilogy. So obviously the film cuts into, although we're going to get into it, there is a way where you can actually make this it a two-parter. There is a way you can make it a two-part, and I'll tell you where the film failed in how it's ad ad adapted the story. And we're going to talk a lot about adaptations, so bear with me. You know, get your meal and drink, bear with me. We're going to talk about adaptation. Look, as far as the good stuff about Dune, you know, I don't want to elaborate on it. The visuals are incredible. The visuals are incredible. And now I can actually talk about the scenes. I mean, first of all, the use of special effects, the use of the art design this this is going to win awards for costume design set design and special effects it just, it just has to and Hans Zimmer listen I don't even care about awards but what Hans Zimmer did musically is extraordinary it is absolutely extraordinary like like it's 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 like it's 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 crazy and and I mean so this is sort of a good point, but a criticism, and we'll get, we'll get to it. Because I watched this thing in IMAX. I think, yeah, I watched it to opening, opening day on, on IMAX, you know, because look, I'm that guy. Opening day, I was there at IMAX. That sandworm attack. Because I remember seeing Sauron for the first time. Helm's Deep. Cloverfield. War of the Worlds. Um, Matrix Reloaded. I do feel that, I feel privileged, like that is a cinematic moment. Seeing that sandworm attack in IMAX was insane. Like when Denis Villeneuve said, oh, you've got to see this in IMAX, I will, I will, we'll get to that. But that's where I agree with him to an extent of like, bro, because my thing does that, you know, see, even seeing it, because I went to IMAX and I went to watch it in the regular cinema, regular cinema was still money, seeing that thing on IMAX, specifically the shots where, there's like two, two shots, there's the one shot where you see the sandworm erupts from the sand. You're like, oh, snap! Because just the scale of it's like, snap! And then there's another shot where you see um, Gurney and Paul run along the sand. And you just see the sand just sort of erupt. And you just see how small they are compared to the sandworm. I'm like, that was just incredible. Just seeing that in IMAX was freaking insane. But the issue is... The, that was that. For me, the film never reached, reached that point. That was a high point of, of the film. And the whole point of the film is that there are high points there, but it's re the finale is where things really erupt. And we'll get there. So, we'll get there, we'll get there. So look, that was incredible. And I just think like, and another big thing is Paul. Because I've not seen any films of Timothy Chalamet, because I mean, he was in Interstellar, but I actually forgot he was in Interstellar because his role was so small. Because even when I saw the trailer, when I read the book, I was like, oh, bro, that is actually how I envision Paul. Because for me, I'm a fan of the Harry Potter books. Bro, whoever, that dude who plays Harry Potter, that ain't Harry Potter. That's why I don't like those films, because how I envision Harry Potter in the books ain't how Harry Potter is in those films. I'm not saying those films are bricks, but nah. 
But how I envisioned Paul from reading the book, when I saw the trailer, I said, no, no, that is Paul. And now seeing him act, I said, no, that's Paul. That is the Paul that I would envision in the book. And he did an amazing job. He was freaking money. Rebecca Ferguson, she was money as, 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 as well, you know. I mean, all the actors acted well. That's not the issue. We're going to talk about the characterization and how the characters were portrayed. So all, they all did their, their job. They all did their job, but we're going to talk about stuff in a little bit more detail. A little more detail. Um, so where are we at now? Um, so we have that there. That's all cool. so they did their thing. Characters. Because see, I like the film, but this film has issues and this film could have been better. But I like the film because it's weird. It's weird because it's weird to like a film, but you can see so many flaws within the film because I like visuals and I like an experience. And especially for me, like whenever I think of whenever I think of films or so of films I like, there's a very strong it's 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 a it's a sub it's a visceral like experience, and that's why like his the use of music, how the music goes with the scenes, the visuals, how he takes to this world, it's it's freaking amazing, you know. And I remember when I was reading about the soundworms because the soundworms in the David Lynch film, those things are, are freaking bricks, man. But how he represented the soundworms, the sound, it was crazy. That's what I want to go. Um, I've forgotten what her name is. Um, let me just get this because it is the lady. Duncan Brewster. I think it's I think it's something Duncan Brewster. I think it's I think it's just, I think it might be Sharon Duncan Brewster. She plays Liet Kynes. For me, she was apart from Timothy Chalamet, she was probably the standout. In terms of because everybody did well, Rebecca Fox did well, but in terms of stand, I liked Sharon Round Rampling. The, the lady who played the Bene Jesuits, she, I liked her. She was good. Like, she really captured how fearsome and how f top the Bene Jesuits are. So, like, and th see, that was amazing. See, that was definitely one of the best scenes. When Paul met the Bene Jesuits, that was a great scene. So, she was good. Sharon Rampling, she was good. But another standard for me was, um, I think, um, Duncan Brewster, who plays Leah Kynes. Because you could... She just helped to really give some context to the world, and just how because you, you, you almost you just you, everything she was saying about Arrakis and so forth was about even when that's something was talking about the sandworm was huge because for me the best sequence the best sequence of the whole film was that sandworm sequence from the from them getting onto the um, on a thop thop -tos, the music that was playing the shots of over the dunes um let's kind of explaining the thing about the desert explaining the sandwich and so forth. I just thought that was just good, but she really impressed me. Um so look, here's here's the, the thing about Dune because I remember before I watched Dune, I remember like people who loved it said that a big criticism they had was that the film ended abruptly. I was like I mean how can it end abruptly when in if you're following the books there is a very clear definitive ending in all of the, the chapters. So how can that someone to be an issue? And when I watched the film the first time, I was like, but from reading the book, I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense of where you would end it. Because you're like, okay, I've now, I've now finished my, um, all this stuff has now happened to me. And now it's now time for me to, to set course, now say what's up with regards to, um, um, you know, fulfilling my destiny with these fremen people. That was the first time I saw it. But then when I then thought about it, then I then thought about the book. And now here's the, the thing, and this is just some... So, so, for those of you, of you who may not have read the book, in the book, the first chapter ends when the Duke and the House of Atreides get attacked by the Harkonnens and the Sadaka army. So that ambush is the end of the first chapter. So at the end of the first chapter, you're like, oh my God, this, he lost his, his father. Everyone is in disarray and so forth. So that is the end of the first chapter. Duncan Idaho doesn't die in that first chapter. He dies in the second chapter. So what they've done in this is they've combined the first chapter and bits of the second chapter. And I think that was a mistake. I think that was a mistake. I think that was a really big mistake, them doing that. Because again, let's just let's let's just talk about it. So, because let's just say that's fine. I would advise them to follow 
what Frank Herbert did. But let's say you want to go this way because this way can still work, and I'll tell you how this way can work. All the stuff as well. We're gonna get, we're gonna get in. The big issue with this is that let's say okay, this is a, Denis Villeneuve wants to do it this way. He wants to combine the first chapter with the piece of the second chapter. Cool. Big mistake was because okay, why do people feel like if the film ended abruptly? That's because the film did not have an ending. It didn't have a definitive ending. It doesn't matter whether this is a part one or part two, you must have an ending. In New Hope, it's ended. Fellowship of the Ring, it's ended. Because at the end of Fellowship of the Ring, like, man, okay, you've gone through all this stuff, all this crazy stuff and everything, and the ending is when the whole fellowship with, with Gandalf takes on that crazy Balrog, and that Balrog um, takes down Gandalf. So you're like, damn, jeez, what's going to happen? What, what happens to, to Gandalf? Okay, so he's now taking this ring. What's not going to happen? Boom, boom, boom. So there's an ending. For me, the big issue with this was the ending for this that's enca that encapsulates this part of the story is um, Paul killing someone for the, for the first time. And what Villeneuve had to establish from the start is Paul has never been in combat. Who cares whether he's the chosen one? He's never been in combat. He doesn't know what it means to engage in, in, in battle. So when he fights that Fremen that wants to challenge him, he gets his ass beat. And he has to go on a journey within the fight to say what's up. It's almost like a rocky fight where Rocky gets beat up, beat up, beat up. And he finds something within himself to now say what's up and now beat down on the, on the guy trying to say what's up to him, man. So the issue here is that end fight was too simple. It was, it was like Paul just fought him, easy beat him, made him yield, killed him, boom. And that was it and then ending. So for people, for audiences... Especially who have not read the book, they felt like, oh, geez, this just feels abrupt. Like, it, it, it felt like if, like, this, this, this story is only beginning to go, but if there was a lot more drama in that final fight, there was a, you, you felt there was real jeopardy, you felt Paul was truly in danger, and he had to really try to really discover himself, find himself, and really grow up within that fight, the people would have felt, because that fight should have been a segment. That should have been a very well particularly choreographed fight that was almost a storyline and a story within itself, similar to a, a Rocky fight. Similar to a Rocky fight. Or similar to when Luke faces um, Vader um, in Empire Strikes Back. It's like that. Or when the Fellowship guys face the Balrog, because that was a sequence. For me, in that fight, we think it wasn't a sequence. It was just like, oh, Paul is strong, he beats him, and that's something like, you, Phil, you, you can't do that. So that's, that's, that's there. And, but, my advice would be go with the, the book. Go with the book. Because if you end the film with that ambush, what you now do is you have that amazing scene with the sandworms, and what you do is you now properly choreograph that ambush. You make that, you, 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 you make it a big moment and you end the film, which is where the book ends, Paul and his mother, they're now on the run in the, in the, in the desert. So people are like, damn, that ambush. But because the issue was in the film, the ambush was, it was not very well done. It was too quick. There was no drama. Like, you didn't feel like if there was a battle. That should have been, that should have been the, the finale of the film is the battle. So the House of Trinity is now fighting up against these, the Sadaka army. And there's a little bit of intrigue and drama with them trying to kill um, the Duke and so forth. But because what if you have that as your finale? This now addresses the other issues within the, 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 the film. In the film, you have to have villains. Like, Lord of the Rings had um, the Uruka. You knew about those Uruka. Saruman. You knew about Saruman. Um, Star Wars. You know about the Stormtroopers. You know about them. You know about all of these guys. Again, this, this goes about show, don't tell. We were told the Harkonnens were evil. We were never shown the Harkonnens were evil. And that is the biggest mistake you can ever be told in films. This is why I always, I have a dislike of Nolan's films because Nolan is all tell, no show. You have to show me that this happens about, you don't, don't, you don't even have to tell me. Show me that this Harkonnens, these guys are, these guys are bad. These guys are evil. You just, bro, I didn't have to be told um, um, Sauron was evil. Those few seconds of seeing Sauron in freaking hell building his own, bro. When Saruman said, when Saruman gentrified and lubricated and colonized an African army and they started to finish for the readers, like, okay, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he's that, yeah, he's that dude. Like, what up? Like, yeah, like, he's, he's that dude. <laughs> yeah, he's that dude. So, you've got to show me that 
produce barren is that dude. Which is why I say it's use of time. Because if the finale was the ambush and the final battle, that means you free up all that time of the stuff that happened after the finale, and that time can be put in so develop the happenings. Show them how evil they are. Show us more of the battles between the Hacken and the Fremen. Show us the Hacken and saying what's up to the Fremen. Show us much more of a back and forth between the Duke and the freaking Baron so that you now establish a back and forth between the Baron and the freaking Duke. So if you give us this, these things, then we can now begin to say what's up. We can now begin to, to say what's up. And I think the issue there that you didn't really feel a strong antagonist in this. And in stories like this, you have to have an antagonist. You have to. Dealing with sci-fi fantasy, you have to have a freaking antagonist, bro. You have to add it. You gotta add it. You gotta add it. Because again, like, whether it's the Baron or whether it's, it's freaking... Because um, there, there's a character in the book who I don't know whether they'll introduce in the second part or so forth, but we'll see. But like Dave Bautista's character, bro, like there has to be an antagonist. And the reason why we didn't really get the villains developed was because I just felt that what they chose to adapt from the book for the first part was, was wrong. Because it's about time. Because obviously, if, cause if it's two and a half hours, bro, after that ambush, it's a good 20, 25, 30 minutes, which that 25, 20, 30 minutes can be used to develop these villains. So that you like, so you're like, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because my thing is, I've read the book, so I know what the happenings are, and I know how messed up the Baron is. But for people who haven't read, read the books, do you really hate the Baron? Do you have any views for the Baron? Because, bro, I didn't read any of the books of the Lord of the Rings and the Nebula, because those books are long. Bro, when you saw Sauron, you, you didn't need to tell me anything about Sauron. You didn't need to tell All I needed to do was see what he looked like, see what he did. I was like, all right, this, this is going to be a problem. Like, this... For the next nine hours of this journey is going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem. And on all Peter Jackson did was just show him for 15 minutes. was like, bro, sound is going to be an issue. Not an issue. It's going to be an issue for these guys, man. So, look. I think that... <sighs> this is the bottom line. This is what I even say. Because, because, because there's, a, there's a massive conversation that I have with some guys. There are only two guys that know how to do this kind of, kind of film. And give you exactly what you need. Spielberg and Cameron. Because Spielberg and Cameron, they understand character and they understand the setting rules you need within this in terms of how you establish the hero, how you establish the antagonist, how you establish the relationship between the protagonist and the antagonist, and how you hit those key story beats. How you hit those key story beats and when you get to the, the finale, how you feel. Because you have to feel it. You should never feel that this film ends abruptly. That should never happen. And it doesn't need to happen because from someone who's read the book, bro, I didn't know first chapter like, you know, damn, well, you know, this is real. It's real. <laughs> like, this is, stuff got real, stuff got real. So, you know, I just think that um, things, but, but it's weird though. A lot of guys who have spoken to, who haven't read the book, really like the film. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, look, bro, okay, if that's fine, that's fine. But because a lot of guys are supposed to have really liked the film. And it's like, that's why it's weird because there's so many issues with this in terms of character, establishing story, story beats, and so forth, and the structure of it that really sells you the heroes, specifically the villains who I felt were underdeveloped. But even despite that, the visuals are so insane. And the, you, you really feel you've been transported to a different world. You know, and this really feels like somebody who really has had a very clear vision, love, and understanding of the world that Herbert created. Because I remember re reading the book, I was about to say, man, look at this place where you're in this desert, and you have all these freaking sandworms and so forth, and the kind of story and the lineage. It's like, it's a very specific world. It's a very specific world, man. So, I mean, look. The film's no look, look, the film is... It's still a money film. It's still a money film. It's still a very good, 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 good film. And it's like, I still, I still like it. And when it, and it comes to DVD, I'll still watch it because despite my issues with it, there's so much stuff of it I like. There are many, there's so many sequences of it I like and there's so much stuff that it does so well that I can sort of be like, all right, yeah, I can work with the bounce of as well. But I just think that, I want to know what, what you guys think. Like, just, just those, there, there are just a, a few things that could have been done a bit differently that would have made... A pretty good film 
an absolutely incredible film. You know, and that's why there's just some storytelling foundations that you really need. And that's why the key thing is adaptation. If they had adapted this in the way I said, in terms of, no, make the ending, the ambush at the very end, and make that ambush a well-choreographed, a quality piece of cinema, of this is like a war, and make it a true, because it didn't really feel like, like a freaking war. It didn't really feel like a, like a freaking war. Because again, if you do that adaptation, you develop Ghani a lot better. You develop Duncan Idaho, and then you really, because the relationship between Idaho and Paul, it, it didn't really feel very well developed because of the use of, of time. So take away that 20, 30, 30 minutes, you know, and bring that 20, 30 minutes and envelop those characters and so forth. And say, What's up? So, guys, tell me what you, what you think about the film and so forth. So I think, what did I even give it? I mean, for me, if I was, I would give this a, I'll give this like a tier, tier two, level three. I'll give this a tier two level three. I'll give this a tier two level three because the visuals, music, freaking insane. It's a freaking amazing world that, that they've built. Superb experience in the cinema, but too many storytelling issues stop me from really entering that kind of upper tier two, tier one arena, man. Like, subscribe, stay black, one love.